In a moment, I'm going to open my talk by sharing a poem with you. First, a little housekeeping. Hi, I'm Chloe, and for the next half hour, I'm going to talk about ethics and technology, a fraught topic at the best of times. Given that too many of us are using a fine dog meme in status updates these days, please be kind to yourself and take a break from this talk if you need to. Ultimately, this is a talk about hope and the future, but to speak to that, we have to understand and squarely face our current reality, no matter how uncomfortable or harmful. One last thing before we begin. My engineering orientation is operations and problem solving. I started as an SRE and I believe very strongly in the value of blameless retrospectives and reflective learning. I ask that as we engage on this topic, starting with this talk and hopefully branching out into our communities, we hold that ethos as our foundational principle. While there's a lot of pretty awful stuff we're going to have to face if we're going to fix it, the way out is to solve problems, not find people to blame them on. With that out of the way, I promise to start with a poem. When I was a kid, I used to ride the bus in San Francisco. On muni buses and streetcars, there used to be poetry in some of the ad slots up by the hangstrap bars. This poetry was paid for by the ads and probably the city and state, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts in one way or another. So I'm pretty sure it's gone now. Unless some startup thought funding it would be good PR. My favorite of these poems was a tiny poem, a single verse, 23 syllables, The Mysteries by Lori Duggan. I ask you to take a moment to pause with me Collect yourself to be present in this talk as I share it now. Everything happens at once. We miss most of it. The kettle boils over and puts out the fire. The kid that fell in love with that poem was living at a pretty strange time. It was the 1990s and post-Cold War optimism warred with slacker burnout. Anything was possible with a Coke and a smile and really big pants were kind of a thing. The internet was a free-for-all most easily accessed through educational institutions or libraries. For me, as a weird, queer-as-in-gay nerd girl, it felt like freedom. Okay, quick aside, here's a weird trivia fact about me. I was homeschooled for most of middle school. To support my education, my mom managed to save enough money to buy a used computer, and we got a home connection to a dial-up ISP. Through Usenet, the World Wide Web, and IRC, with mom always nearby if I had questions or needed help, I found a whole new world. Even back then though, there were some places it wasn't safe to be too much of a girl on the internet, and some places it wasn't safe to be a girl at all. Much of the common vernacular was racist, ableist, sexist, or homophobic. Walled gardens, such as America Online and CompuServe, existed to put a mostly family-friendly veneer on what was presented at the time as a lawless Wild West even by its champions. But the digital age was coming and the 21st century was dawning and things were going to get better. If we partied like it was 1999 and survived the Y2K bugs, we'd be in a new golden age. Thanks to Moore's law and decisions made for social, political, and financial reasons, the price of tech manufacturing kept falling. Technocratic optimists and professional futurists predicted this would be the turning point where humanity would make its next great leap in front of us, the opportunity to remake the world. And we, humans collectively, failed. As the cost of creating technological, com technological components decreased, we distributed them unevenly. Mines and factories were set up in resource-rich places, finished products shipped away because these countries didn't have the infrastructure or framework to use them anyway. The final homes of these components were determined by an astonishingly small group of people concentrated in a handful of locations around the world. The haves got more, the have nots lost yet again. And the first iteration of our digital universe built on the shaky foundations of exploitative manufacturing and a completely unintentional culture created mostly by bored math and science students was thus directed from a handful of corporate campuses almost all located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Still, on top of this cheap and abundant hardware, we had another chance to build. And once again, before us as a species dangled the promise of a better tomorrow. Software development could be the great equalizer, could be learned by anyone, could remove human bias, could improve quality of life, could be the great and powerful Oz. That great and powerful Oz thing should have been the giveaway. 
He's a character in a book and later movie about a girl from Kansas who gets lost in a fantasy world. She believes the great and powerful Oz is a wizard who can save her. Only it turns out Oz is just a powerless charlatan hiding behind a curtain, pulling levers to create a giant hologram of a face and speaking through a tube to amplify and distort his voice. At best, he's a pitiable failure. At worst, a malicious predator using the girl's desire to go home to strong arm her into committing a murder. Instead of the utopian world we were sold, software engineering took on a mythical quality incentivized by an irresponsibly sized influx of money that functioned best when replicating existing relationships and social structures. We made the creation and maintenance of software almost mythological, preferring origin stories that began at Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, or getting arrested for hacking into a phone company. And then we built a world of extractive microtransactions and loot boxes and ad systems designed to figure out your heart's desire and put it in front of you and always on digital assistants who send your recordings back to a company that only exists to sell you things to feed the Hydra's other heads. We bought an idea hook, line and sinker about meritocracy and computers being impartial. The joke's on us. They'll impartially execute whatever bias you've programmed them with and not even blink an eye. They don't after all have eyes. A computer will never tell you you've just accidentally excluded people of color before invisibly redlining your housing ads because the search criteria were cultural and not racial. A computer will never tell you that automatically rejecting resumes with a five to 10 year work history gap is probably sexist. And as your friendly neighborhood nihilist will cheerfully tell you, merit is a lie because there's no such thing as objective meaning, so that's a talk for another day. But everyone knows that investors need to make their money back and a good story is worth its weight in marketing gold. And so as an industry, we wrote a collective creation fable for ourselves that algorithmic decision-making and machine learning would be our literal deus ex machina. The computer would be benevolent and wise. The computer would transcend her petty human emotions. The computer would bring order and justice to the galaxy. And we collectively agreed to ignore the man behind the curtain, writing the code to make the computer go. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip us forward to the present. While I could spend a whole talk just exploring how we got here, this is still a rescue mission, not an archeological dig. Today, we're more than two years into a global pandemic that changed our world and our lives. We're confronting climate emergencies and failing infrastructure and the very lethal Venn diagram where those things overlap. In the United States, we're experiencing an epidemic of gun violence but the world over, we're not just seeing, but experiencing greater divisiveness and polarization leading to violence against already marginalized groups. We use cute phrases like post-truth to minimize the distress we feel over informational context collapse and institutional distrust. We spend more of our lives than ever on the internet, connected to our devices and connecting to others through social media. Where bots were once charmingly clunky and obvious, they are now the well-honed tools of disinformation artists and other malicious actors. And we as individuals have to somehow discern them from our friends and family. We are surveilled constantly, not just by products we use for free, but by ones we pay for. And we often have no idea what data they're collecting or how it's being used. I actually have to stop here for a second and talk about this because it's absurd actually absurd in a Samuel Beckett waiting for Godot sense. Have you heard the one about Tim Hortons? On June 1st, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada released a report of their findings in a two-year Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act investigation of the fast food and coffee retailer, Tim Hortons. The investigation was triggered by an article in the Financial Post by James McLeod, who installed the Tim Hortons app and discovered just how much data they were collecting about his location. James wrote, I didn't realize how much until I saw my coordinates in a trove of data that RBI sent to me after I made a request under Canada's Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act last fall. According to the data, Tim Hortons had recorded my longitude and latitude coordinates more than 2,700 times in less than five months, and not just when I was using the app. For perspective, napkin math makes that approximately 18 times a day that the Tim Hortons app collected and reported back on Mr. McLeod's location whether or not the app was open. If that wasn't creepy enough, Mr. McLeod goes on to write, 
I had no idea how extensive the tracking data was until I saw it. There were readings taken at all hours of the day and night, and RBI kept tabs on me every time the app thought I was visiting one of its competitors. I've added the emphasis. When asked about this, the representative of Tim Hortons suggested that this data collection was all outlined in the agreement to let the app access the GPS, that allowing the app to access GPS was completely optional, and that if Mr. McLeod didn't wish to be tracked, then it was his responsibility to turn off the GPS access to the app. As a systems nerd, I find the report pretty interesting and I encourage you to go read it, but to spoil the ending for you, the privacy commissioner found that Tim Hortons did collect the data and failed to collect even an attempt at appropriate consent. For their part, Tim Hortons has agreed to delete the data and never collect it inappropriately again. Honest. And this brings us to the hard and ugly truth. Much of what has come before is broken and destructive to individuals, to societies, to our planet. As technologists, we're now trapped between accepting that and remediating it, or continuing to push it behind the couch or under the rug because each of us is just one person and the way forward is hard and we can't do it alone. Everything is happening at once, as Lori Duggan said, from environmental destruction through crypto mining that's always six months away from moving to a more energy efficient blockchain, to systematizing bigotry and abuse through the use of predictive autocomplete results in search, that dehumanize members of religious or ethnic minorities, to blind social and systemic pressure to extract as many dollars through microtransactions, subscriptions, and add-ons as possible. There is too much to see all of it. We're left shocked by each kettle doused fire instead. I'm drafting this in the wake of a trial about domestic abuse that was served up on social media in bite-sized clips, like it was the best sketches on SNL to watch on your train to work on Monday morning, as if we should cheer victims and boo their abusers like it's a sport. And in the year of bad date furniture store guy, whose name I'm not using because he's a human being too. I'm writing in the shadow of a racist shooting featuring a manifesto copy pasted from an internet message board known for being a source of radicalization. So much like the 1990s, it's a strange time to have a relationship with technology. Back then, my messengers of choice were AIM and ICQ on a desktop computer the size of a microwave oven. On February 24th, 2022, I downloaded Telegram to an iPhone that fits in my pocket for the first time to keep abreast of a war on another continent. And for a while, I had a nightly ritual of waiting to see pictures of a sunrise on the other side of the world. The quiet hours of evening spent waiting for inevitable cosmic phenomena became unsurprisingly contemplative. I thought about evenings I spent on IRC as a kid making friends around the world. I thought about my Babcha who fled Krakow fairly young and never returned. I thought, I kid you not, about how everything is a matter of perspective and the world was so large we'd never be able to know all of it and so small I could put it in my pocket. I felt a small, but persistent defiance. I'm exhausted and angry and I want more than this. I want you to want more than this too. So with my remaining time in the tradition of the 1990s and its manifesto writing zine culture, I present a declaration of how we should do it instead. A prescription for what ails us, a beat you can build a remix around. And it starts with this. The internet is a real world. Everything we do in tech, Every line of code, every instance scaled, every app and algorithm has effects on the lives of others. Now, today, and that must matter more than a hypothetical future. As technologists, we are powerful. We've constructed an entire global communications infrastructure over the last 40 years that still seems almost impossible if you really think about the details. I'm speaking today over a broadcast medium that will make it to space, not from a television studio with complicated equipment, but from the comfort of a home office. The world we live in today could not exist without us. We must understand that power, be responsible in its use, and be accountable for its consequences. It will be hard and scary. It means being intentional in everything we build from the moment of conception. It means committing to exploring all the effects of our decisions, not just the ones that are easy to translate into dollars or your local currency of choice. It means understanding that there's no such thing as an externality if your decision was caused by or results in it. It means holding each other to a higher standard. It means holding ourselves to a higher standard too. 
a standard defined by the fact that the story of technological innovation is the history of human development. Every invention, a manifestation of intent and imagination where nothing existed before. A standard informed by the fact that we can change reality with a thought and enough electrons. We must center that standard in an ethos that protects and promotes human empowerment, dignity, and social equity. There is a better world possible, not built of blockchain records of right clickable JPEGs or monetizing outrage cycles, but one that creates access to knowledge and the flourishing of a multiplicity of people and cultures. We used to be brave enough to imagine it, a technological future that resulted in matter replicators, instant transportation, solid holograms, plasma swords, light speed travel, and terraforming. A future where technology was a multiplier of our potential, not an accelerator of our worst days. That world is still waiting for us, but it relies on our choices and our curiosity, our bravery and our strength. It requires us, you and me, the builders and architects to see its potential and call it forth. And to get very vulnerable and squishy for a moment, it requires love, not romantic love, not familial love, but a very real kind of love nonetheless, the love of what could be, of the world we could build. Love might seem like a strange word for a talk at a technical conference. We spend so much time in tech talking about hard things, logic and procedure, validation and repeatability. Love can't be validated or benchmarked. It can't be procedurally recorded. So why invoke it? Why bring it up here at the end of a talk about how to concretely build a better world? Because every dream worth dreaming starts from the heart, starts in love. Each of us listening right now, I can almost promise, has a story about something they built from love, an app to stay in touch with someone long distance, a way to help people in their town fight parking tickets, a blog theme with fiddly bits that bring them joy to look at. Each of these dreams started not with how to make a ton of cash, but how to bring love and joy to the world. Since I told you the story about Tim Hortons, I want to tell you another story too. A story about a developer with a little too much time on his hands at the beginning of COVID and a partner who liked games. On November 1st, 2021, 90 people were playing a little game he wrote for his partner. By mid-January 2022, hundreds of thousands of people were playing. This engineer ultimately sold his little game, a riff on Hangman, to the New York Times. That little gesture of love was Wordle, built by Josh Wardell. When we reach into the place in us that feels love and hope, when we reach into the place in us that dreams of something bigger and better, we don't just build technology. We build connection and human comfort. We build hope and joy. We build belief that there is a better world than this possible and that the limitations we suffer under now can be surpassed. We build a future worth believing in where suffering is reduced and potential is empowered. That's the more I want. That's the more I want you to want too. The title of this talk, Tomorrow Can Be a Wonderful Age, was the unofficial slogan of Tomorrowland. I was inspired by Walt Disney, who collaborated with scientists, physicists, and others who would go on to build NASA in creating a place where people young and old could go to be inspired by imagining what could be possible. Ray Bradbury, a science fiction writer who has inspired so many of us, referred to Disneyland as a Schweitzer's centrifuge, a place to spin people metaphorically and inspire them, ignite their curiosity, stuff their heads with ideas, and send them whirling out into the world to build brand new dreams. While the castle may be the center of Disneyland from eye level, I believe Walt Disney saw Tomorrowland as its heart, the place people would be kaleidoscopically spun and filled with brand new dreams. At Tomorrowland's entrance on a plaque is the text of Walt's dedication. A vista into a world of wondrous ideas signifying man's achievements. A step into the future with predictions of constructed things to come. Tomorrow offers new frontiers in science, adventure, and ideals the atomic age, the challenge of outer space, and the hope for a peaceful, unified world. I'd like to close by thanking you for your time today and to conclude with this. If anything I've said today sticks with you, I hope that this will be the thing, that it takes that kind of love and vision to build the future, that we as technologists have the power to build it, and that it begins with being curious, imaginative, and brave. Thank you.